thank you from the bottom of my heart for sticking around. I've been to so many conferences over the years where the last speaker, or the headline act as I like to think, <laughs> plays to an empty room. Um, I'm James Wright from, from MOLA, as it is now. Uh, I have the very grand title of senior archaeologist, but I can assure you I'm really at the very, very bottom of the pile where MOLA's concerned. Um, I'm a buildings archaeologist primarily. Uh, I've been working there for five years, and I've had the, uh, the great fortune in my career to work at some absolutely astonishingly high status properties. Um, and I'm going to talk um, to you today about two of those principally. The, uh, the Queen's House and Knoll. Uh, the Queen's House is at the Tower of London. Uh, it is a middle 16th century structure which was originally constructed in about June, well it started, certainly was underway June 1540 on the orders of Thomas Cromwell. Uh, and it was a rebuild of a medieval property which was the uh, home of the lieutenant of the tower, so effectively the king's representative uh, at the Tower of London. It's called the Queen's House as a misnomer. There's a legend that it was built by Henry VIII for Anne Boleyn, but of course in 1540 she was lacking a head, which is very apposite for what we heard about earlier actually. Um, so that's the background of the Queen's House. Uh, Knoll is the largest country house in the United Kingdom. Uh, its roof space spans something like 6.7 acres. It's an absolutely enormous place, seven courtyards. There's this horrible uh, rumour that it was a calendar house, but it, it has at least 420 rooms, so that's a, that's a really big leap year. Um, it was a medieval uh, house begun in the middle years of the 15th century by uh, Sir James Fiennes, who fought at Agincourt, made a ton of money from ransoming French prisoners. He was a bit of a, uh, a swashbuckler, really. He ended up, uh, again, having his own head removed, so again, coming back to this, uh, this theme from today. Uh, and the property was bought by Thomas Borsha, Archbishop of Canterbury, and then it uh, increased and increased and remodelled over time to the point where we had these three great courtyards and then uh, stayed in the hands of the Archbishops of Canterbury until the Tudors got hold of it for about 80 years and eventually they sold it to the Sackville family who are still gamely living there 400 plus years on. So these are the two properties that I'm going to speak to you about today and the, uh, the, 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 the cultural tensions and anxieties which are displayed through interesting uh, graffiti within the buildings uh, which we're going to look at. Take the Queen's House first. Um, it sits in the angle of uh, the inner courtyard at the Tower of London, you can see here. It's an L-shaped building with a medieval tower, a 12th century tower, just in one corner. And you've got a south range which is slightly earlier than the west range here. Uh, they are, broadly speaking, the same phase of building, except for the fact that very clearly, structural reasons, uh, you can see that they built this one first and then tacked that one on, almost as an afterthought. Um, so that's, that's the building itself. It's the only timber frame building within um, the, the old um, city of London as well. So we're quite, uh, we're quite uh, lucky to have that, actually. Um, as you can see from this rather measle-like uh, distribution map, there is an awful lot of ritual protection going on within the Queen's House. You can see down on the eastern end of the South Range, there's a, a great distribution, and then again within the West Range, and then some down at ground floor. I should point out that all of these marks were recorded during a conservation programme when I was only really there looking at roof structures. So I wasn't asked to look at the rest of the house. This is not the complete picture at, uh, at the Queen's House. There is a lot more there, I'm sure. So just having a walk round, for example, uh, on, on, on a quiet morning, found some at ground level as well, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, so we have 54 burn marks, a couple of the Marion marks, a couple of grid patterns, and a compass-drawn design. Um, so again, 59 marks in total, a pretty dense distribution, and, and certainly one of the, the, the largest numbers of ritual protection marks in a building of its size recorded. Uh, most of them being, of course, burn marks. 
Um, I'm very, very convinced by the experimental archaeology done by John Dean and Nick Hill in Vernacular Architecture Group's journal. Um, they've been kind enough to, 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 to send me some of their slides. In fact, they took the top two especially for today. So that's really good. Uh, I asked them to, uh, to, to, to uh, send me some photographs of them actually creating some of these burn marks simply to illustrate the fact that these are not accidental. The old uh, adage that they are lamps that have been left unattended or candles that have fallen over simply doesn't hold truth. Uh, uh, if you leave a candle like that, it simply goes out and it leaves an amorphous scorching. It doesn't lead to this classic tear-shaped design. And if you leave a taper attached to a, a, a beam or a timber with a piece of dung or something like that, it will simply burn straight down and again you won't end up with that beautiful tear shaped mark. In order to do that you need to hold your taper at a very very consistent angle for about 15 to 30 minutes and at some point during that you will actually need to scrape out some of those mark uh, some, some of these soot and charring that builds up as well. So this is not accidental, it is a very very deliberate ritual action that's going on. Uh, we've heard so much today that I really don't need to cover the, uh, the, 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 the ideas about threshold protection, the idea of, of uh, windows, doors and of course chimneys being this place which was creating tension and anxiety for the occupants of the house who were worried, uh, very, very concerned about malignant possession of the building uh, as a result of them. Um, so if we look at some of the marks in relation to their portals, um, I, can, I can show you how some of the distributions at the Queen's House fit that pattern. So for example, in this, in this most easterly roof, roof A, we can see groups of burn marks here, which are clustered in that position there, around, uh, underneath, in fact, underneath a window, and this one here, this group here, on a Queen post truss, uh, right opposite a door that goes out onto the lead. So you've got those two very, very classic uh, positions of groups of burn marks. Uh, and there are, there are also scribed marks as well. So you can see this very, very beautiful, quite simple Triscally design. Of course, endless lines, demon traps, <coughs> pinning them to the walls. And then also the classic uh, Marion mark down here. Again, these are related to windows and doors. This one is... Uh, in an uh, equidistant point between a window and a door uh, and this one overhangs uh, an inserted loft hatch between two roof structures. So again that classic liminal portal between uh, different areas of the building that was causing concerns. Uh, and next door in what we call roof C you can see again a mesh pattern scribed onto a queen post again right opposite a door. Um, in the same roof, though, something slightly more interesting going on. Yes, you've got a very dense distribution on this particular queen post truss uh, with lots of groups of burn marks all over the place and also some on a purlin down here as well. And that queen post is, again, next to the door out onto the leads. So you, at that point, you might think, well, fair enough, we've explained that one. Until so we started looking at the archaeology of the roof itself, you can see here something off the, uh, the, the, the visuals of, of what my workplace looked like for about three months of last year. Obviously they've taken all the tiles off as part of the conservation project. But what we did notice is that the final bay of Roof C, which you're seeing here, this far end, ha had been at some point had its common rafters removed uh, and then put back in place. Originally this roof had a gable end, it's that one there. This is a 16th century drawing of the tower and it shows it with this gable end. Now it has a hipped end and that hipped end went in in the 18th century. Uh, and I think what happened was, is of course there's air plunging into the building and so they put this very dense distribution of burn marks on simply to allay those fears and those anxieties about the passage of air into the building over what was probably quite a prolonged period of time while, whilst they remodelled the, the end of that particular roof at the Queen's House. So to ask the question, well who was putting these marks on? In this instance, this Marion mark here, I think we can be very clear that it was the carpenters. Now, these carpenters were remodelling this section of the Queen's house in the later 17th century, so it's been heavily remodelled, lots of documentary evidence for that. But that particular 
type of scribe has been very, very noticeably done with a carpenter's raised knife with that kind of half round profile. Absolutely classic uh, uh, trace for a carpenter of the period putting that on. So we can be pretty clear that it's the tradesmen who've been involved there. Now for the burn marks, we're slightly less clear. It's very, very difficult to actually date burn marks. You sometimes can, but unfortunately none of these can we get a specific date on. If you want to hear about dating of burn marks, ask me later. Um, I tend to think it was the occupants of the house. And in the 17th century, we know that the uh, house was occupied by five of the lieutenant's family, including himself and his wife, three children, but also six servants as well. And these areas, these roof structures, are quite low status. They, they, if they were being lived in, they were being lived in by people that were not in any way connected with the high status occupants of the house. So you can see here, for example, that uh, uh, these rafters do not have any uh, traces of sort of lath and plaster or nail <coughs> holes on them. Also, they were probably using these spaces for storage as well. They certainly were floorboarded and floorboarded in the 16th century as well as the 16th century floorboards. So again, we've probably got uh, the servant, serving staff using these roof structures either for occupation or for storage. And as a result of that, I think we can be clear that it was probably them who were putting the burn marks on. Um, not all of the burn marks are clearly apotropaic. Uh, in the western range, there's a, there's a group here, again on queen posts, quite dense distributions and groupings of them, you can see one here, that are nowhere near windows and doors at all. And something else seems to be going on in this instance. Uh, and I think that we should be, 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 be open and not too didactic to the idea that, that not all burn marks are ritual protection marks. And in fact, that there may be healing rituals, there may be prayers, there may be enacting the prayer, so like lighting a candle in church now. Uh, there may be something to do with purifying the room uh, after maybe an illness or something really terrible happening in there. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. And also it might be latent candle mass rituals as well. So there might be lots and lots of different explanations for what was going on in these spaces. It's also worth bearing in mind that later on in time, these burn marks were giving people the willies. Quite literally, they tried to remove them. So you can see here where they've line rendered over this tear-shaped burn mark and we've sort of half sectioned it to, to reveal what was underneath. And here, more convincingly to my eyes, there's three or four of these as well. They've actually tried to chop them away. So perhaps there was a latent understanding that in some way these were connected to a process dealing with evil. And in a later, more enlightened period, that was seen as a superstition which was to be hidden away, to be removed, or literally covered up or chopped out. So there's, the, although these marks probably started as a result of cultural anxieties, later on they created another cultural anxiety as well. Um, one room where there aren't any burn marks at the, at the Queen's house is in the, uh, the council chamber. This is where the Privy Council of England used to meet. Um, this is a very, very high status space. You'll notice there's lots and lots of timber available for burn marks or graffiti to be in there. It's absolutely blank, totally and utterly barren. This was clearly off limits to the serving staff in the household. It was for the very, very highest status people in the land to enact their meetings. It's also the room where they tortured Guy Fawkes. So you can see that it's a room where there was certainly, not tortured, rather interrogated, there was certainly a reason to be concerned about what happened in this room, but they weren't marking it up, probably because the ordinary people were not actually engaging with the space itself. Uh, along with the graffiti in the building, we also were extremely fortunate to have a go at a spiritual midden as well. One of these decoys in a void adjacent to a chimney. And you can see me there at the, the bottom of it. You can see how deep this thing is. It was mainly full of 1960s builder's rubbish. And at the bottom, we found what was an 18th century 
uh, spirit midden full of 46 butchered animal bones, it had scraps of leather down there, it had a broken bladed tool, a bit of a spade, uh, and a broken pipe dated 1700, 1770, all in a very, very discreet cache. Now there might be earlier stuff below, we were only at, we were told to stop excavating at that point. As far as I know, this is the first time that an archaeologist has ever had a go at spiritual midden as well, so we're very, very lucky in that respect. Um, and you, you can get the impression that this was a building which was in some way vulnerable to fire. It's a timber frame building, and what we seem to be looking at here is, along with the burn marks, uh, we might be seeing an inoculation of the building against uh, the vulnerability of malignant fire setting. And of course, it was a building that was at risk of fire during the Great Fire of London, and we do have a record in 1604-5 when the kitchen burned down. Interestingly, the kitchen is underneath that spiritual midden as well, and it's actually the kitchen chimney that was next to it. So there is a link between the concern of fire setting, and I think what we might be seeing here is protection against the, the, the concerns that uh, witches might in some way be setting fire to, to, the, um, to the building. And there is, of course, that connection between possession of a building coming down the chimney breast. You can see from this contemporary German illustration from about 1600, here's a witch trying to enter the chimney. Uh, and she's able to do it because the apotropaic symbols have been scored through, they've been cancelled out, so she can actually come down that chimney. So there's your, your sort of artistic documentary evidence from the period. Uh, at ground floor, uh, there's this particular doorway which has about 15 or 20 ritual protection marks around it, very dense distribution. I think it was probably a prison cell at some period. It has no windows at all, it has solid masonry all around it. Uh, it's on the same corridor, you can see here, as this doorway, which was where Thomas More was imprisoned. So we might be looking at a building which has been, or a room which has been purified as a result of the probably quite shady things that have gone on there. I mentioned Guy Fawkes earlier. It, it is certainly a building with a very, very grim reputation. As I say, it was, it was the place where he was interrogated. And across the way at the tower as well is the, the, the space where Everard Digby, the gunpowder plot's financier, was kept as well. And he's left his own graffito there. And as you can see, it's a bit like Guy Fawkes' signature. It's not the best handwriting in the world, probably because they've broken his fingers. And another building, the second building that we're going to look at, with a gunpowder plot connection, is Knoll, down in Kent. Uh, and I've been working there for four years now. Um, in the early 17th century, Knoll was being remodelled on the orders of Thomas Sackville, who was Lord Treasurer of the, uh, of, of the country. He was very, very high up, very, very close to the king. And he was remodelling the building as a Renaissance progress house with the intention of attracting further pa power and pa patronage to his family. Uh, he was remodelling a particular area of Knoll known as the King's Tower specifically for the occupation and use uh, by James I, who we've heard so much about today. He is, of course, the great witch-finding king, a great sceptic, of course, at the same time. He thought of himself as a very scholarly and academic man. However, he certainly had a reputation for an interest in witchcraft. So when we found this enormously dense distribution of ritual protection marks carved again using a carpenter's raised knife on one of the beams in the King's Tower, so the alarm bells were set off. And you can see a whole series of different ones. There's kind of a bastardised pentagram up here. There's interlocking VVs, uh, a checkerboard here, mesh patterns, VVs on the fireplace, 13 marks in total, um, and also some, uh, some burn marks which were running horizontally rather than vertically, which told us immediately that those burn marks were put on when the beam in question, uh, which is shown here in the drawing, must have been upright in the framing yard. So again, they've been put on in very deliberately by the carpenters working it down at Knoll. <coughs> we can also see that all of the apotropaic marks are on one side of this beam, and that is the beam, side of the beam facing this fireplace. And what they have done is created, effectively, a protection zone around that fireplace. Uh, we know from documentary sources that the bed originally sat here in the centre of the room on one side. So you've effectively got 
fireplace which is causing all of those tensions and anxieties, ritual protection marks, and then the, the sleeper in the bed, vulnerable to possession, is actually covered and is okay. And of course, whoever was sleeping in this room, it's directly above the king's chambers below. He's a very important person, possibly even a member of the royal family himself. Um, this is what the room looks like today. It's a storeroom with some of the Sackville's accoutrements in. Um, we were able to get dendro dating off the beam, and lo and behold, it was felled in the winter of 1605, so at the time of the gunpowder plot. And we know from documentary that it was being laid in the spring and summer during 1606, which I find to be the most interesting time related to the story of the powder treason. It's the time of propaganda. It's the time of, uh, of, of the state response. It's the time where fingers are being pointed. And all of those fingers were pointed at the Catholics but they were blaming the Catholics for being in league with Satan himself. There was various ways that they did this. So there's um, Cecil himself describing the powder treason as an abominable practice of Roman Satan, unequivocal there, that they were blaming hellish forces. James went in and gave this really fire and brimstone speech to Parliament where he was using very emotive words. There was public sermons. Shakespeare's Macbeth was a... Uh, um, written, which is of course is a powder play, it's all it's riddled with powder references um, and of course he was writing for the king's man, he was a, a hired retainer. So you've got enormous amounts of work going on to try and put across the idea of Catholics <coughs> being in league with Satan and this is my favourite illustration there's Guy Hawks with his famous lantern, now at the Ashmolean, about to blow the mine under the House of Lords there behind him is a devil whispering into his ear, giving him the ideas. Behind the devil is the Pope, and the Pope is having tea with Satan himself. You know, this is not subtle stuff at all. This is being consumed by the population. The language that's being used is very much like post 9-11. It's fear, it's terror, and it's manipulation, propaganda being put across, putting down the bad guys effectively. Now, okay, not only riddled with ritual protection marks, this grows every day. I've never given this lecture twice and that looked the same because we're finding them every time we go into Knoll. However, what we have found is that the distribution is not as dense anywhere else as it is in the King's Tower. So if you go into another one of the high status bedrooms, the Spangled Bedroom, which has the big posh bed uh, and the fireplace, there's a beam running along there. And on that beam is just one ritual protection mark not 13 like in the King's Tower. They were really, really, really going to town. And they were so concerned about this that even sort of into the middle of the 17th century, they were actually stuffing shoes and bits of clothing up that chimney as well. So sort of 50, 60, 70 years after the powder treason, it was still causing tensions and anxieties at Knoll. So there was a, continu a continuity of ritual protection, which at Knoll goes way, way, way through time. So that recently when I was surveying the old laundry, uh, there's a burn mark on a roof structure that dates to 1878. So it's continuing right through this tradition of burn marks in buildings. And just to finish off today, I thought I'd give you a little bit of an idea of how our thoughts are thought of on the bottom half of the internet which is a place I urge none of you to ever go to, ever. It's a very dark and shady place. Um, but when, I know I'm preaching to the converted today, but when you read the bottom half of the internet, well, we were accused of trying to desperately uh, link in a story to Guy Fawkes, spelt wrong there, and we did release this story on bonfire night, so yes, technically I suppose we were a bit guilty of that. Um, or it was just doodles. We got carpenters writing in saying that these marks were practical and were part of the, uh, the construction methods. Um, obviously the old ritual argument comes up, you know, our archaeology, they're obsessed with ritual. And then of course we have to justify our funding as well, so we make up stories. Now if we skip across to the Tower of London, the bottom half of the internet was as busy then as well. Uh, I'll just let you soak that one up. <laughs> that was my favourite one, actually. <laughs> and they also accused the, the old ritual argument as well. But I think 
the best one to round up with today is really to say it would seem that the magic work, the tower is still intact and standing. Thank you very much. Are there any questions or are you desperate to get to the boozer? I know I'm feeling thirsty. <laughs> um, could we go back to that uh, devil? Your devil having tea with the Pope? Yes. Oh, it's only a few slides back, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. We certainly can. It's one of my favourite illustrations. It does kind of seem lined up up there on the top of the gable. They look like yes. severed heads. Yes. It's it's almost certainly, yeah. yeah. And on top of that gable, we've got an owl as well, which is a symbol of sort of the yeah. night and yeah. terror and evil, yeah. too. Yeah. So, yeah. And it never got blown up, did it? No. <laughs> well, it got burned down. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> in 1834, it definitely burned down. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> not, not yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah like, got it after that. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Just to Jim. comment, uh, I think you were the second or maybe the third person mentioning James I. Yes. I think we should ask ourselves, James I had been king in Scotland and while king wrote this book, Yes. Um, which part of the Demonology 1597, I think. Yeah. Um, we should begin with him and wonder what effect it had on English people yes. after Elizabeth. I it think, must have been a catastrophe for them. I, I think I you're right. You could quite understand about the treason part. I, I think, yeah, I mean, the, 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 tree, the powder treason has been called the last great Elizabethan. Catholic plot because yeah. after that there really wasn't anything like it. It really was the final word in it. I think the state took hold of it, but I think also it shocks society so much. Mm. But it shocks society because they got the message out there in a way that Elizabeth never managed to do because it was such a, uh, a it was just such a huge enterprise that they that they attempted to literally wipe out the whole of ruling society. <laughs> and, and I, <laughs> um, and I, I, I think it certainly had an impact, and, and certainly James's views had an impact on later witch trials as well. So Pendle, well, well, Pe when, when Pendle happened in 1612, James had nothing to do with it, but the people that were trying the Pendle witches had clearly read demonology, and it became a trial in the model of James. Now by that point, James wasn't really interested in witches. He got far bigger things to worry about in the country, so he kind of moved on. So early part of his, um, his reign, not very interested in witches. Then he gets convinced that witches are after him, after, the, uh, after the, the North Berwick witch trials, which he gets personally involved in, and becomes really, really hot on witchcraft. When he comes to the English throne, you get these strange cases like uh, Anne Gunter being brought before him in Oxford so that he can try it as a witch. It turns out that he's so sceptical, he says, oh, she's not a witch, she's not a witch, she's not a witch. She's spitting pins out of her mouth. Uh, and he proves that it's a, it's a hoax and then sort of swans around being extremely proud of himself at having unmasked this <coughs> hoax, uh, this hoax. And then later on in, a, in, a, in, a, in his reign, he, he just not interested in it, he's doing other things. But the impact of his book and of his reputation went far and far and wide. And also the, the state propaganda, I think, helped to, 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 to keep that in the mindset and really to set the ball rolling for some of the more unpleasant witch trials in this country. Yeah. Any other questions or are we wrapping up? I think that's it. Brian, do you want to <laughs> <laughs>